All right. Hello, everybody. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, I am Laura Albright, bringing you uh, in partnership with Shayla Rexrode, our another week of FI Connects. I do want to apologize. There is lawn mowing going on right outside my window that they just started um, about five minutes ago. So I'm hoping with the AirPods, uh, it does not pick up that outside noise. But again, that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. So we will roll with it. Um, like I said before, I am Laura Albright and um, I'm happy to be joining you. I think week five now of our FI Connects elementary session and there's a new face this week with me and that is Shayla. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, my name is Shayla Rexrode. I am really excited to be able to join you for the conversation today. Um, I'll kind of be behind the scenes supporting Laura, be monitoring the chat. So any questions or things that you have, feel free to post them out there. But I'll also be posting links to resources that Laura is sharing. So we hope that you will um, take advantage of that, but also take advantage of the chat and know that I am out there watching and listening. Thanks, Laura. All right, so uh, just a couple logistical items here and some background if you have not joined uh, one of our sessions before. Just wanted to give you a little context of where we're coming from. So we are um, the Professional Learning and Leading Collaborative within the Friday Institute, which is housed at NC State University. And we do a lot of K-12 outreach and um, support for educators, teachers, administrators. Uh, and so we're happy to bring you another week of our FI Connects. For uh, Zoom today, you'll notice that you are all muted. Uh, and if you have a pressing question or something you'd like to share with us, feel free to unmute yourself and pop in. Uh, you can also utilize the chat. As Shayla had mentioned, she's going to be monitoring and she will jump in and um, flag me if there's something that I should address. Uh, another item to note is that if the participant videos are distracting to you, you can always uh, minimize the videos. And so uh, that is another feature for you. Utilize kind of those Zoom features that work best for you. So uh, just kind of the background on where this FI Connects came from. When we embarked on the remote learning environment, we wanted to provide some research-based support for teachers and educators that was very specific to the needs right now. And we wanted it to be informal and inclusive. And so it's kind of evolved week by week, but we really feel like the opportunity to share and connect with each other has been beneficial for ourselves, for each other, for um, our students. And so we appreciate your continued support and in joining these conversations. So we'd like to hear from you. I think some folks have already shared in the chat where you are from and just a fun way to get to know you. Imagine you could talk to your favorite book character. So whom would that be? And what would you say to them? So I'd love to know that. your favorite book character and what would you say to them? So I put Miss Frizzle from um, Magic School Bus because I was a science teacher and I love Miss Frizzle and um, she, I would just probably ask her, where do you get all your good ideas? <laughs> Oh, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Oh my goodness, that was, yes, one of my favorites too. <sighs> so putting you on the spot here with your favorite book character, but oh, Miss Piggle Wiggle. Mm -hmm. This might be a fun question to ask your students too, um, or you know, share the last book that you read or what has been your favorite book that you've read while you've been at home? Or is there a book that you would like me to read to you? Junie B. Jones. OK, 
Carolyn had said. And then I talked to the little prince, ask how he did after the book ended. Yeah, Amelia Bedelia, so good. These are so great. All right, let's keep, feel free to keep sharing in the chat. Um, would like to get a little pulse check on where your district is at through this transition. Shayla is going to drop in a link to a Mentimeter. So she just dropped that in. And within that Mentimeter, you are going to either select that A, you are 100% online, or B, you have some instruction online, or C, you will have no instruction online, meaning you are paper packets. So I'll give you a moment to respond to the Mentimeter that she just shared in the chat. And I will pull up the results. So these have shifted slightly from where we were week one and uh, even weeks, the weeks following. So it looks like the majority are, ha have some instruction online and then, and then it looks like some folks who've responded in the chat are also saying some instruction online. All right. So that just gives us some good context for, um, the conversation. So thank you for that. Where we're going to go today uh, is thinking about how we can better support our students in this remote learning environment by teaching executive functioning skills. Um, and so we'll kind of do a overview of executive functioning and then really focus in on a couple of those skills that are really relevant to remote learning and also how uh, brain sciences is related to remote learning. So how can we, how, what does brain science have to say about remote learning? How can we support students in this environment? And then our social emotional learning. So our team has done quite a few webinars on social emotional learning. And so um, continuing this conversation and really digging into how we can support students um, I've been using the term crisis schooling because it is not necessarily homeschooling. Homeschooling is a whole different um, realm. So we're really needing to support students with families who have lost their jobs. Maybe they've lost family members to the virus. Um, all sorts of things, much, much different than homeschooling. So to start this off, I'm gonna give you a quick assessment all you have to do is count the number of F's that you see in this statement. I'm just gonna put it up for a couple seconds. Here we go. All right, so how many did you see? Share in the chat. How many F's did you see? Three, mostly three, four, five, six. El, Elena, I think is how you'd say your name. I'm sorry. You saw six. The majority of us saw three or four. So here they are. There actually are six F's. So we all read the same thing, but why did some of us see three, some of us saw four or five, and I think maybe one or two of you saw all six. Um, so there's a couple reasons for that. And one of which is some of us just went ahead and read the statement. Um, and so we actually read the words on the screen what, rather than actually looking and searching for the Fs. The other reason we maybe didn't see all six was when we read the word of, we hear it as a V, not an F. So our brain may have overlooked that, but it was all right there in front of us. So, you know, crazy to think that we missed just a simple set of instructions. Um, 
but we may be needing to have this new set of eyes. So of course, if I prompted you with those instructions in the beginning to say, look at each individual word, find each F, um, you may have been able to see all six. So what else could we be missing that is right in front of us? Um, are we too focused on the next thing that we don't actually see what's right in front of us? So for example, um, some of us were, like I think Chandra had said, we're reading the words and kind of we're just reading the beginning part because actually our brain doesn't read the full word. Um, so we miss it. And um, so what could we be missing in terms of supports for our students because we are trying to just be in, we're rushing through to the next thing and unintentionally and rightfully so in this remote learning environment, we're all kind of going in overdrive mode. But the answer actually could be related to executive functioning. So supporting our students um, through teaching of executive functioning skills. Just gonna look in the chat here to see if I missed anything, but it looks like Shayla is. Oh, Seth, okay, counted the F in the Friday Institute. I guess I should have been clear on that, didn't I? I did say count the number of FCC. All right. Um, and yes, Gabriella, um, missing the F and of, and I think that's probably, that's what I, that's what I did as well. So executive functioning, um, what is it and, and what does this mean? So these are the processes that we use to complete daily tasks. And these are life skills that must be taught and must be practiced. A lot of the information that I'm gonna be sharing with you today comes from Christina Scully. And she has a great website with very thorough information on executive functioning for mostly elementary age students. She has some great graphics. She has some great um, resources and supports. She has some good tips and tricks. So if you're looking for kind of the hub of information for uh, supporting executive functioning for elementary, this is where uh, a good amount of this information comes from. So is executive functioning nature or nurture? Are some people more apt to be better organizers? Are some people predispositioned to pay more attention in class? Is that influenced by their genetic makeup or is it learned behavior? Is it nurture? Uh, to what extent does our environment play on developing the skills to be able to initiate a task and then complete it? To what extent does the environment play in being able to organize our um, assignments and make a plan for how we're going to complete a task? Is that learned behavior or is that um, a genetic predisposition? So the answer is that it's a balance of both. And so any research that you see on executive functioning, you'll find that it is a little bit of both. Some of it has to do with our biology, our genetics. If our parents um, struggle with some of these items, we may be more likely to. But at the same time, it could be the opposite where our parents um, do not struggle with this, but they have a child that does. So again, it's a balance of both. Today, though, we're going to focus on the four executive functioning skills that are have the yellow star. So the other um, piece about executive functioning is, depending on where you look, they might break it down into eight executive functions. I've seen as little as three executive functions with multiple subgroups. Um, but this, again, came from Christina Scully. I thought the graphic was very easy to understand. It resonated well with me. and. Um, so that's why we're, we're going with this one. It's, um, and then I also wanted to highlight these four because they're the most relevant and relatable in terms of our situation right now in our remote learning. So that's where we're going today. We're going to um, highlight just these four. So we'll start with attention. And attention, as we know, is the ability to focus on a person, an activity, a task. Um, to stay attentive. So what might it be like for a student who struggles with attention and focus? So we will 
I just realized my closed captioning is turned off when I stopped sharing my screen. So I'm going to turn those back on. <laughs> Apologize for that. Um, we're going to experience that through the eyes of a student. I am going to go through this simulation and you will just follow along and experience what it may be like. Actually, the lawn mowing has stopped, so I'm going to turn off my AirPods because I think this will work better without them in. All right. So here we go. Here is the simulation. Okay, put away your books. We're going to play a game. In this game, we're going to find homes for the animals. Listen to me carefully. In front of you are some animal cards and a grid. I'm going to tell you where to move each animal card so every animal ends up in the right place on the grid. Are you ready? Everyone take the snake card. Now look at the grid. Put the snake card on the camel in the grid. Got it? Good. Now take the bird card and put it on the kangaroo in the grid. Dylan, are you with us? Okay. Now take the monkey. Put it on the I don't seat. have a monkey. Is that yours on the floor? <laughs> now, now find the kangaroo the card. It's the one yeah, on the ground. Too, remember? Emma and Maddie, pay attention. <laughs> Dylan, are you with us? <laughs> okay now, everyone. Look at the octopus. Ew, weird. You're great. Now look for the elephant. Jacob and Sophia, please stop. <laughs> Put the elephant on the board. Uh, I want you to place the rhino on top. Mr. Dino, I saw rhinoceros at the zoo when I went with okay. my mom. Put the monkey on the chest. Jaden, don't interrupt. I don't have any and animal flap. Miss Aldano, my game camera. is missing a piece. Ready? <laughs> now flip your cards over. What do you see? Okay, so I did not pass that assessment. <laughs> um, clearly, I failed, but I was paying attention the entire time, but I was still not successful. Um, why was that, I wonder? Um, share in the chat how you, how might this student feel? Or if this was you going through this simulation, how you might feel? Frustrated, overwhelmed, and anxious. Yes, that was me for sure. Defeated. Mm -hmm. I was trying my best. I mean, I was, I had the, the, I was ready. I was paying attention as much as I could. And at one, a couple times, I just kind of gave up too, <laughs> right? Because I didn't hear her, so I, I couldn't. And I guessed at one point, and I clearly put it in the wrong spot because that did not look like an, an elephant. Um, but how might this student be perceived by others? Well, by the educator or by the teacher, um, they may be perceived as someone who's not paying attention. They may be perceived by someone, uh, perceived as someone who just can't complete their work, they can't finish their work, um, or someone who's unmotivated, right? But I know for myself and in that scenario, I was motivated, I wanted to complete that, uh, I was interested in what she was having to say, but I couldn't hear all of the instructions. So while that was a in-class scenario, Thinking about our students who struggle with attention, they might also have a lot of outside factors and um, situations at home where it's difficult for them to pay attention as well. So maybe they have other siblings or family members in the home now, maybe the TV is on 24 seven, maybe they don't have a proper place that they can do their homework and be closed off um, from outside noise. Maybe it's just on their, in their kitchen table. Um, and so there's all sorts of distractions that are happening for these students at home as well. Um, and I was trying to catch up here on the chat and I think Shayla had mentioned, yes, that um, the, the slides, the stimulation, the links, you're gonna get all of that at the end. So 
Um, it's really good stuff there for sure. So how can we support students who struggle with attention and um, giving clear one step directions with visuals is probably one of the best strategies in addition to building in routines and consistency. Um, for our students who are in this remote environment now, they need an easy way to access the information and it needs to be available to them in the same place with the same similar look each time. So you don't have to um, put pressure on yourself to develop these very glitzy and you know, flashy slide decks because actually for some students, the students who struggle with attention, that can be a distractor for them. So plain slides that have the same symbols or um, navigation tools, the simpler, the better. Um, Providing structured and regular breaks. So believe it or not, some students may not know that they have permission to take a break. So if you are providing asynchronous instruction, something, you know, some online, some not, you can actually put in there, now is a good time to take a break or stand up, get some, get a drink of water and come back when you feel ready. So um, that's another good solution. On the bottom there, I have the suggestion of offering fidgets. And um, while fidget spinners may be banned at school, they may not be banned at home, but the, the research and the science behind this is actually when a student who struggles with attention has a way to keep their hands busy, it actually increases their focus and attention on the task at hand. So they're keeping their, their mind busy by tapping the pen or by squeezing the squishy while they're also completing the assignment or while they're also listening to your um, mini lesson on um, on the computer. So I think for elementary teachers, um, this is really beneficial because again, teaching students how to utilize these fidgets as tools and not toys is is very important. Um, and reading reading the chat and trying to talk at the same time as you know is not very successful uh, but teaching students how to use these as tools and not toys by actually providing them with the resources and then saying keeping keep your hands busy and they'll find that they're more um, attentive so as we move along into another skill that needs to be learned, that is of task initiation, which is the capacity to take action and get started. For our, so for students who maybe don't complete work, but they have, they want to do it, there's something missing there. What's the missing piece? And how can we support them? So it's kind of like a rocket ship, ready for liftoff or not. Um, and being able to start this task do it even if you don't want to do it. So here is an example. Um, if I provided you with this task, go ahead and read that on the screen. Are you able to complete that task successfully? Go ahead, share in the chat. Do you know what I'm asking you to do there? Seth says no, and why does it have to be scarlet? Or how does it become scarlet? Someone, Courtney said she can do it, but she doesn't have recycled paper and some people maybe. Okay, well, what if I asked you to do this? How many of you can do that? Right, so the, the example on the left was about the most complex abstract way I could come up with of drawing a stop sign. Or I could just say, draw a stop sign and I could give you a picture of a stop sign. You, so if a student who struggles with task initiation, they may not know how to get started because the directions may be to them um, abstract or too complex. 
Uh, so providing with a simple visual, again, simplifying it as much as possible. And this is so important for our remote learning environment because we don't have that one-to-one -one face to face interaction. We don't have um, a long length of time with our students like we do in the classroom. So as simple as we can get these instructions. So again, how might the student feel? We've kind of talked about that. They may feel discouraged. Um, they may feel overwhelmed. <laughs> they may feel incompetent, right? Inferior, yes. Very much lost, frustrated, and defeated. And then how would they be perceived by their peers or perceived by the teacher? Yeah, maybe just incompetent. They might be perceived as incompetent, like, well, they can't do that, right? Yeah. Right. Well, and um, just as the simple switch of directions from making it abstract to concrete, think about um, how, our, how we could reach more of our students that way. So a couple ways to support students who struggle with that initiation. Um, cute little strategy of pretend you're a rocket ship and we're going to take off in five, four, three, two, one, and we count down and now we're ready to go. This could even be something that you simulate and you demonstrate in an asynchronous lesson. It's a way to set the tone for them to get started and then they know, okay, at that countdown, I know as soon as my teacher says blast off, I'm ready to learn. Um, and as elementary teachers, I know you in class, you have very cute little tips and um, sayings to get your students to begin work. You can do those uh, on a recorded video lesson as well. You can support these students by chunking, by creating a priority list. So you, you can even just explicitly say, do this first, then do this, last do this. Um, so chunking is, and we've talked about that in previous sessions, so, so beneficial for all students, but especially those who struggle to get started. They may just, like we said, be very overwhelmed. Uh, and then rewards. Of course, it's so rewarding, even for adults, to be able to cross something off a checklist, um, but it's also rewarding to get a reward for some sort of completed task. So um, providing students with a little bit of reward for something completed. Another executive functioning skill that um, needs some practice is that of working, working memory and the ability to keep information in our heads when it's needed. So working memory gets really technical on the brain side. And so we're going to think about this pretty high level. Uh, so like I said before, it is that ability for us to complete a task in the short term that we and it may transfer over to our long-term memory but maybe not we need it in the moment and then after that we don't really use it anymore so we're going to try this in your head solve this problem and if you have the answer go ahead and place it in the chat All right. So if I calculated this correctly, when I put this together, I calculated 30 when you take 23 plus 12 and then you take that answer minus five, right? So now you knew how to do that because you were accessing your prior knowledge. You were in the moment, you knew how to solve that problem, but then now tonight when you're sitting down for dinner and you're telling somebody about that this webinar that you sat through you're probably not going to remember that this example the answer was 30 and that's okay because you don't need that information right but at the time you needed to know how to solve this problem and now after that you don't really need it so that's an example of working memory for our students who lack this skill, this is really hard for them, or maybe not lack the skill, but struggle with this skill, to be able to take some information, use it in the moment, and then 
get rid of it. So again, to support these students, we can um, chunk information. That's kind of the tried and true method. Um, but really giving directions in sequential order. And I was um, thinking about this with my own child and how sometimes when I give her directions, I will say, you know, go upstairs and get dressed. But before you do that, put your toys away. Well, for someone who struggles with working memory, to her and putting that in order, she kind of got lost in the directions because I said, go upstairs and get dressed, but first put away your toys. Whereas for a student I could support, I would say, clean up your toys and then go upstairs and get dressed. So putting items and directions in the order of completion will support that student um, through, through working memory. Um, when we're thinking about our asynchronous instruction or even our synchronous instruction, anytime we can tap into their prior knowledge, it's going to trigger that working memory. Oh yeah, I did know how, I do know how to do this, or I remember doing this, um, is going to be beneficial for our, for that student. And then the last executive functioning skill that we'll talk about today is that of organization. And the, the thing about executive functions is we never stop learning these. And as adults, and I know for myself in this remote learning environment, I'm still kind of working out my system of organization and planning and prioritizing. Uh, so we're all in this together, right? So how about that student that says, can I borrow a pencil? I can't find mine. I know I had it. It's not here anymore. I just used it, but I can't find it. And then as the teacher, we're thinking, really? You did not just ask me for another pencil or, you know, you ask me for a pencil every single day. And we can have these assumptions about students that like, get yourself organized. How can you not remember a pencil? However, despite their best efforts, um, they are trying. Um, but how can we support them? How can we teach them some skills of organization? And I was a, um, a middle school teacher. So the pencil thing was huge, right? <laughs> They're going from class to class and somehow in between they've lost their pencil. So if you could share in the chat, how might this student feel? They have their pencil, they just had it, they can't find it, or somehow their homework got misplaced between home and school. Flustered, embarrassed, stressed. Mm -hmm. I know some of our students who need some support with organization do seem all of those things they seem flustered and they seem frustrated yeah definitely and so then they are perceived by us as the educator or us or by their peers as being maybe unmotivated maybe um like they don't care lazy right oh you forgot your pencil again because you just don't care <laughs> right Yeah, so, but we know that that, that may not be the case. Um, and so how can we support these students? Well, one method that I think is a fascinating way that is to provide students with an organizational boot camp. So we're all in this new environment. Um, we all are trying to figure out how to be organized. And maybe there are some students who, even though we're five weeks in, are still struggling to get their system together. So maybe that is you recording a little mini lesson to show them, here's my system. Here's what I'm doing to stay organized at home. Um, showing them uh, what a finished product looks like. So by completion, here is the product that you will have to show me. So for those students who struggle to get organized, it's kind of like task initiation. They don't really know what success looks like. Um, so anytime we can scaffold that, is gonna be supportive. So in addition to executive functioning and supporting our students in that manner, brain science also tells us some things about visual literacy and more about chunking. So in terms of visuals, we've, we talk about this a lot. Um, we know that it simulates brain function and increases retention and visuals can be anything. I would say for an elementary student, this visual would be too complex. So the working memory would be an overload because there's a lot of information in there that they don't really need, right? So the simpler, the better. 
Uh, but we're going to practice what it is like to interpret a visual. And it is a from the New York Times. And each week they post a what's going on in this picture. And it's a picture from one of their photographers without a caption. And the students interpret what the picture um, says or what the picture is meaning. So here is the picture in just a moment. But while you are looking at this picture, think about um, what you see, what you think, or what you wonder. So what do you see? What, are you, what do you think is happening? And what are you wondering about? What you, questions do you still have? So I'll put up the image for a couple seconds. There it is. So what do you um, think is happening or what do you wonder about? What do you see? Go ahead and share in the chat. One of these, maybe it's a C, maybe it's your think or maybe it's your wonder. So Jennifer's wondering what they are celebrating. And Courtney says, is this present day? Because they're not six feet apart. That's a good question. <laughs> We have, yeah. Right, so I'll tell you what they're actually seeing, what they're doing. And this is actually uh, a celebration. So if somebody said it was a celebration and it's Islamic students celebrating Teacher's Day. And so they release these balloons uh, with little handwritten notes and messages as part of the festivities. So the date is back from 2010, but the image was actually published just um, onto the New York Times on March 1st. So uh, yeah, and just a little context of this, what is going on in this picture. Um, I had mentioned before that each week a new image is released. Uh, and then on Thursday, they, re they reveal the actual caption. So depending on your age of students, this may be um, not appropriate for their age. However, you can still find any picture you would like, have them interpret what is happening in that picture, and then you can do a reveal. Um, the cool thing about this New York Times, though, is students on Thursday afternoons can live chat with the photographer about this picture. So. Uh, uh, Teresa, sorry, I'm reading names. Shayla had dropped in the link earlier about um, where to access this. So again, we know the importance of visuals, especially in a remote learning environment. So just a little bit about chunks and chunking information. And we're gonna try this uh, more, more work on our brain here in just a second. So I'm gonna give you five seconds to memorize the following letters on the slide. Just five seconds, memorize the letters. Here we go. All right, how many could you remember? If you're comfortable with that, you can share that in the chat. How many letters could you remember? Three, four, five, maybe six. Yeah, okay. So we'll try this again. How about now? How many did you remember this time? I would venture to say <laughs> yep, now, now they're coming. I think my chat was delayed there for a second. Yeah, more, you were more successful this time, right? It's, there's a couple reasons why you were successful. For one, it was chunked, right? Uh, it was chunked in threes. They were uh, alternate colors, so there was some visualization happening. You could remember that the first three were black, the next three were red. Um, so that signaled the visualization part, but then it activated prior knowledge. So we all are familiar with HBO, PBS, ABC, CBS, and um, the FX. So those were actually the same letters from the first time around, just presented in a different way. They were chunked, it was activating prior knowledge, and I utilized the use of visuals kind of without you really even knowing it by changing the color. 
And that is really all to say that our brains have a limited capacity. Elementary students can only hold up to one to two bits of information at one time. Um, so, and just for, for reference, uh, adults can only hold up to seven bits of information. So that does grow as we get older. However, even as adults, we can't hold that much in our brains. So for elementary students, giving them only one to two bits of different information at once. Um, and that can be something like they are being asked to color and label. That's a, probably about all they can do or write and draw. So one to two bits of information. Um, and that can be in the task, but it can also be in how we're delivering the content. So if this is a science lesson on um, living things, living and non-living, we would really only be talking about living and non-living, the very most basic uh, information about living and non-living organisms. Um, we would, if we were talking about plants, we wouldn't necessarily need to talk about trees, flowers, um, prairies, grasses, and forests all at once. We would just talk about one or two of those at a time. In terms of that as well, our younger stu students younger than 14 can only spend about five to 10 minutes on passive learning. So that's things like reading, um, listening, watching, like watching a mini lesson, <laughs> um, reading a text. They can only spend about five to 10 minutes of that on passive learning. Now this is different than active learning that which is like watching TV or playing a video game or playing a game on the computer or the iPad. That's active learning because they're doing something. Um, passive learning is just that absorbing of information. So again, less is more and then even less. Um, as we wrap up here, I'll just kind of touch on how we're meeting the social and emotional needs of our students because we know that executive functioning is so important to reach these kids. We know that there's brain science to back that up, but what about the heart and what about um, all the things that they might be dealing with right now? So how can we support our students? There's a lot of links that Shayla is going to be dropping in uh, in these next few slides, but remember that you're going to get a link to a whole, another curated document that has everything else in here. So don't feel like you got to click all the links in the chat um, and keep up with that because they will be on that one, one master document too. So when you're providing your synchronous or asynchronous instruction, keeping the emotion in there, keeping, you know, your heart, which is, how are you doing? How's it going? Um, and just really checking in with them academics aside. Um, they, they miss you and you miss them. And just like you would in the classroom, you would have those personal conversations with them. You can have those conversations with them now too. They, you can send them a little video. They can send you a video back, um, short, clear, concise, um, but really making them feel like they're still valued. We've shared this resource from Kristen Zimke quite a few times, but we just keep going back to it because it's so good about mini lessons and how we can, again, chunk information, uh, but on that social emotional side. So you're saying things like, today I'm going to teach you, sounds a lot different than today we're going to learn about, <laughs> right? Or uh, watch me and then I'll have you try instead of you do this. Right. Um, so how we say things is very important in this remote environment. I found a really cool resource that Shayla's going to put the link to on utilizing what families already have at home. So some family engagement opportunities, but then also just um, really simple things that they can do at home uh, for Things like wordplay, and I think there's some synonym, antonym things in there. There's sight words. There's all sorts of really simple games and um, ideas of how we can utilize what we already have at home. So the link is, this is of course gonna be linkable when you um, get the slides, but there's also a lot of resources on their website. Uh, there's also a slide deck that goes along with these that the activities are linkable as well. 
And then we can, of course, provide students with just reliable content resources to say, hey, you know, stay up to date, stay in the know of what's going on. And maybe there's a current events assignment that um, you offer to students. So they can choose something that they enjoy, something that resonates with them. And um, they can pick it from maybe one of these options. So maybe this week it's on Time Magazine. So they pick a, an article from Time Magazine and or maybe it's the Sports Illustrated Kids. The Dogo News is um, mostly current events. And those are updated, I think, daily, actually. So those are really good as well. Personalize the feedback. So we know grades and that sort of thing are kind of in flux right now, but students still need feedback. And if not now, more than ever. So any way we can personalize that feedback via single point rubrics, um, or just even uh, a recorded video of give, use, giving your students feedback. Some more resources, like I said, lots and lots of resources. Um, Tar Heel Reader, if you're a North Carolina teacher, maybe you're familiar with that, which is a collection of books that are read aloud to students, but also they can create their own book. Students pull from images from Flickr and they create their own book. Um, it's really neat. Maybe have seen Classroom Screen, um, have heard about the, digi or the Disney Bedtime Hotline. Uh, that's, I personally haven't tried that yet, but I know some people that have. And then the Teaching Remotely in Times of Need is a massively overwhelming slide deck. So I'm giving you forewarning on that. If you are on information overload right now, maybe just save that one for another time um, because it's kind of a, overarching look on remote learning, all things from parent support to new tools to use to differentiation. So like I said, it's a little bit overwhelming. So don't pressure yourself to, to grab that one right away. But that's all to say, <laughs> think about your favorite teacher or maybe it was a college professor and what is one word or phrase that would describe that person. I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Just think about that person and then share in the chat. All right, so the words are coming in and Linda said supportive, Claire said positive, Terry kind, inspirational, yes. And I would venture to say your students probably describe you that way as well. Um, and remembering that, you know, this is, these are not this is not, you didn't share a lesson or an assignment, right? That, uh, that made them your favorite teacher. You shared how they made you feel. And so we know that emotions are linked to some of the most powerful memories, positive or negative, good or bad. Um, but they instill in our long-term memory and they're there forever. Even if we haven't seen that teacher since third grade or they were our favorite teacher in 10th grade. It's been years and years, but we still remember the way that they make us feel. And that's because there is a strong, strong connection between the heart and the brain. They talk to each other, they communicate. And um, we know that people do not remember what we say to them. They don't remember um, what we ask them to do, but uh, they do remember how we made them feel. And uh, we love this quote from Maya Angelou because it's so true, right? Students and people will always remember the way that we made them feel. So that's to say that emotion trumps all. So everything with, these, with executive functioning, everything with brain research that we've talked about, we know that emotion and heart and passion, all those words that you have just described, trumps all of this. So how we can make our students feel loved, supported, encouraged all of those words that you just said um, during this time. Shayla did just drop in an article that I found recently on a trauma-informed approach to teaching through the coronavirus. And I think this is from Teaching Tolerance and so, um, or tolerance.org, really great article on, you know, 
the, this experience uh, may be completely, like what we are experiencing or what you are experiencing might be completely different than what one of your students is experiencing. Um, and so coming at it from a lens of trauma and crisis, right? Because that really is what it is. Um, so it was a nice little check for me and um, just kind of a, like just a check in on, you know, how am I really supporting my students? So <laughs> um, I always try to give you some time at the end for questions and of course the evaluation, but um, so I realized that was a very quick 50 minutes. But now is your opportunity to ask a couple more questions. Um, Shayla's gonna drop in links here for the recordings, for the slides, for that master document. She's also gonna drop in the slides for the um, evaluation. But you know that you can find all of our FI Connect sessions on our YouTube channel. We've had between, oh gosh, I, I don't know how many we've had now between our elementary and coaches and principals. There's lots and lots of good stuff on there at the YouTube channel. But for the survey, keep in mind, if this is your first time doing these surveys, at the completion of your survey, when you click submit, it will give you a link that says, now you can click this link and get a certificate. So on that certificate, you probably are gonna have to change the name and you're gonna have to change the date. But because we are offering these through the FI, we can go ahead and give you your certificate right away. So just don't close that window after you click submit, um, click the link in the message box, that will take you to your survey. So, oops, here is the link. Um, bit.ly slash FI connects. That's also in the chat. And Zoom, as you are aware, has uh, removed the option to make these hyperlinked in the chat. So you're going to have to copy and paste that into your browser or just type it in. <laughs> And then Chandra saying, yeah, that you talk about executive functioning. That's awesome for early childhood. Wow. And then let's see, RS, um, you had asked about a whiteboard background. Doesn't even remember what that was. So I am not sure what that is. However, a lot of the, well, some of the pretty fancy Slides come from either um, Slides Carnival or Slides Mania. Uh, Shayla, I don't know if you use any other ones. I use Slides Carnival a lot. Uh, I love, love Slides Carnival and I'm actually pulling up the link right now and I'll drop it in the oh, chat. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, oh, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a slide deck? Hi. No, it was not a slide deck. It was, um, it was like a background that you can use. So something I've been trying to do in Google Classroom is then if I'm doing a Google Meet, then I can switch, you know, present my screen and then switch over. But it was, it oh. was kind of like Google Jamboard, but it was better. I mean, it looked so much better. It was really nice. It was blue. It had a clock. It looked kind of like a teacher classroomy kind of thing. And I went back and searched through um, some of the things, but I just couldn't find it in there. And was it, um, okay, I was gonna say uh, Jamboard, but it's not that then. What about, was it, could it have been classroom screen, you think? Maybe, classroom, I'll, I'll look at that, yeah. That maybe. one has, you can put up um, a timer, you can put up like student names if you want students to be in certain groups. You can put up um, a window of directions. I'll There's, check it, yeah, it might have been. been it. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, if anybody has ideas. I also had another quick question. If, um, if anyone knows whether, so if I'm in a Google Meet, can I pop something up on my screen that I, like if I'm already presenting a screen, can I put something else up on that screen without having to go to a different window? Like a sticky note, like not, not switching to Jamboard, for example, and putting up more stuff but just the screen that I'm currently presenting popping up something on there. Um, <laughs> so you said not like a sticky note? 
Well, like a sticky note, but not having to leave. Like, for example, if I'm showing a Starfall video, but I'm at the Starfall website, so mm -hmm. it's got the video up there and it's got the text. If I wanted to like underline or if I wanted to put a little sticky note. I see what you're saying because I do know in Zoom, you can annotate while you're sharing okay. your screen. I don't know about Google Meet. That's actually a really good question. I'll search those. Google. That's a, that's a good search term. <laughs> yeah, annotate. Yeah. Um, and I know it seems like Google Meets updating features daily. So um, who knows? But yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, thanks. Yes, you're welcome. And Laura, I did want to point out um, to folks in this survey, I believe it in there's one or two questions that are it's gauging um, if you would like to continue to participate in these discussions. Again, we want to make sure that we're providing resources and taking time that is really valuable to you. So if you would also just indicate if this is something that you would like to continue to see us uh, facilitating, that will also help us decide what the future of FI Connects might look like. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Yes. So it looks like the links are working well for everyone, which is always a good thing. <laughs> um, so we will continue to drop in the link for the survey and that master list of resources. Within that master list is a link to all these slides. And it's actually a link for a presenter mode of the slides, but then also a a make a copy version. So if you see things in here that you want to actually take and use, please do so and repurpose this for your own use, you can do so. So that is in the uh, curated resources link. And apologies that we can't make these prettier links, but Zoom is keeping us safe, I guess. <laughs> So that's a good thing. Thank you, Gabriella, for, and Irina and Chandra for the positive feedback. So nice. We're a couple minutes before three o'clock. So I did just want to thank you once again on behalf of Shayla and myself and the Friday Institute for continuing to um, join us for these FI Connect sessions. We love this time to share with you, but really just to get to learn from you as well. And I know each time we're together, I learn something from these sessions, even though I'm the presenter. So I love learning from you too. And we'd love for you to keep in touch with us via email or Twitter. Um, and that survey is really important for us to know kind of how you want to continue the conversations. As Shayla was saying, we're looking to maybe restructure either the uh, offering in terms of the group that we reach, if we want to collapse into um, secondary and elementary together, or if we want to offer these more on a monthly basis. So anyways, we would love to know your feedback on that. But otherwise, if um, you do not have any further questions, um, feel free to sign off. We will stay on and um, we'll catch up on the chat here. Cheryl says the survey link wasn't working for her. And then yes, you can definitely share the slides and the links with teachers, of course, please do so. Yes. Carol, I'll drop the link for the survey back out there for you to see. And you might need to copy and paste it into a new browser window just to see if maybe that works for you. But I'll also put the long link mm -hmm. um, out here as well. In just a second to the actual form. Because this one may work a little bit better for you. Yeah, because I was Thank trying you. to get onto the survey link. Hello? Yes. I was trying to get onto the survey link and I put it in. It's not on going through. Can Maybe, you, did you put it in so I could just copy the link? Like click the link on? So we Zoom has disabled the ability to make these hyperlinks. Um, right. So they're only in text form. So Shayla did just drop in the long full link for it. Um, that should hopefully work. 
If you just okay. go ahead and grab all that text, yep, copy it and then paste it into your browser. Okay, let me min minimize it so I can see the screen so I can see. Where did she put it?